It's Baxi's Musical Podcast. In the summer of 2020, I interviewed Glenn Matlock of the Sex Pistols. We talked about a bunch of stuff. We talked about being in the Sex Pistols. We talked about not being in the Sex Pistols. We talked about what was fact and what was fiction. Because when it comes to Glenn Matlock, there's been an awful lot of fiction. For example, the story used to be that Glenn was tossed out of the Sex Pistols for listening to the Beatles. Then the story somehow turned into Glenn getting fired for listening to the Eagles. The truth is... He wasn't tossed out of the Sex Pistols at all. He quit on his own. Why? Because being a member of the Sex Pistols kind of sucked. Great band, pretty important too. But when you are actually in it at the age of 21 and you're being exploited and dragged through the savagery of the British press and you've been dropped by two record companies and the gigs are being canceled and you've pissed off the Queen, maybe leaving the Sex Pistols wasn't such a crazy idea. The Damned and Iggy Pop and Sylvain Sylvain from the New York Dolls. He's played with Primal Scream. He was also in a band called The Rich Kids with Midge Ewer, the other guy responsible for creating Live Aid and Band-Aid back in the 80s. And in 2022, he joined Blondie on tour and is currently recording with the band as well. Simultaneously, Glenn Matlock has just released another outstanding new solo record called Consequences Coming, featuring Clem Burke of Blondie and legendary guitar player Earl Slick. We talk about that, the late Vivian Westwood, and all about the Danny Boyle miniseries about the Sex Pistols and the lawsuit that came with it. This is my conversation with Glenn Matlock of the Sex Pistols on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Hey, Hey, Glenn, how are you? I had um, problems finding the link, brother. (laughs) It's It's quite all right. It's good to... Good to see you. Oh, okay. Yeah. We talked over the phone uh, around uh, the summer of 2020, and uh, we spoke in real general terms about this, about the album that you just released. Uh, at that point, I don't even think it had a title yet, but Consequences Coming is absolutely fantastic. I love Head on a Stick. What a great, great song that is. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it's been a slow train coming, but it's all right. <laughs> It's kind of nice to hear, and it probably isn't uh, so much for you, but it's kind of nice to hear an angry Glenn Matlock uh, for a change. I don't know if I'm angry. I'm all right. I, li- I do like that expression, that, um, revenge is a dish best served cold. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's kind of the sort of the flavor of my album with some of the, the sniping that I'm doing lyrically in it. But, I, you know, I, don't, I didn't try and make too po-faced a, a record. I'm trying to got a way of expressing myself that's a bit tongue-in-cheek sometimes. Right. I, uh, I was reading some other uh, interviews you had done, and you know, specifically one of the things that, uh, that you're very passionate about is Brexit and how that's specifically affected how this affected musicians in the U.K. I, I, explain what Brexit has done to musicians over there. Well, what it's done is, is cut the United Kingdom off from Europe. We were part of the european union fam- family and we could come and go as we liked work trade fall in love live there and now we can't so as far as the restrictions go is it is it a matter of visas is it a matter of waiting or just more economically it's matter, difficult it's a matter of visas it's a matter of having a car now if you want to take instruments and trucks and stuff then back line and you're only allowed to stay there now 90 days out of 180, wow. which sounds like a lot. But before, you didn't need any of that. And it's, it's become a whole obstacle. And it's put up barriers to trade, and it's put up barriers to trade with the car industry, who now all want to get kind of electrified and have, you know, like Tesla's. I've got a Tesla built. It's like Jaguar's making one. But they get their batteries from Europe. And if they get them from Europe, and put them in a car here and then try and sell that car back to Europe, it then becomes subject to all these these trade barriers that weren't there before that our government have voted for. And they can't understand why Europe are annoyed with us. Above and beyond that, it was a way of kind of hoodwinking the, country, the populace of the country to suddenly be, swerve and become far more right-wing. It's like Trump with his wall with Mexico. 
It was just a whole thing to kind of make you feel, I don't know, kind of insular somehow, or, you know, the, the bad is of the foreigners. Well, I was going to say, it, it, it sounds not too dissimilar what goes on here in the States, because, you know, while many people were convinced of rhetoric of one way or another, whether Brexit was going to be a good idea or a disaster, we here in the States kind of get the same kind of thing. You just, you just don't know who to believe. Do you believe the government that's in place? Do you believe the media and, you know, voters and citizens are kind of left at a loss? Like, well, what's true? What's, uh, what's bullshit? It's, it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I've learned in life is you've just got to constantly read between the lines and see who's got a vested interest about this that, and the other, you know, and I don't pretend to know all about American politics and I don't know that I should be putting my finger in your, your guy's pie kind of thing. <laughs> but I do know that there's certain people in this world that if you're sitting in a bar and somebody like Trump walks in, you just think he's a right wrong on that guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, and you want no part of it, and you probably either say something or you just get up quietly, get your coat, finish your drink, and go to the bar <laughs> down the road. But you don't want to be tainted, right? You, know? you uh, you mentioned that this was uh, that the album was a slow train coming. You know, you've kind of been dealing with a lot of issues with getting this record out. One, I mean, there's there's COVID in the middle of it, but then also you you've also got very very busy along the way too, and uh, some of it's great, some of it not so great. Tell me about what stood in the way of getting this thing out uh, in in a timely fashion beyond COVID. Well, you have just been a, a, an older kind of musician who's not particularly got a great track record of being a solo artist in his own right, <laughs> getting the right kind of backing. You know, everybody wants to pigeonhole you and you are the bloke who used to be in the Sex Pistols. Well, that's fine. I was. But I refuse to be just that guy. And I think that shows because there's a certain level of respect when, for example, the folks from Blondie want you to, to join, uh, you know, on their tour. I mean, in a way, that's put me backwards a little bit. You know, in Blondie, I'm the bass player. And I enjoy playing the bass, and I like playing bass when somebody else is singing. But what my real call in life is, is this album that I've made, you know, and I'm just trying to, you know, with the help of guys like you, showing some interest in it. But you're more than just the bass player on this record. Obviously, you're doing vocals, well, but also guitar, too. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not even really playing bass on it. The guy who plays bass on most of the album is Norman Watroy from the Blockheads. You know, so I, I feel, I, I don't know, I know you've got soccer in, in America a lot more than you used to have. But if you watch a centre forward or a striker in a football, in an English football game, or maybe even an American football you know, somebody else has got the ball, but the guy at the front who's got to score the goal, he's kind of pointing to where he wants the ball to go so he can make the most of it. Now, if you're a bass player in a band and you're doing a show, right, right. but you're the singer, and then you want everybody to clap along and you over there do that and you're playing the bass, you can't stop playing. You can't do none of that. <laughs> so, but when a guitar, you can go, blam, and you at the back there, you do that, blam. So it's to do with showmanship as well. <laughs> And, and, and anyway, you know, I always started out as a rhythm guitar player. I don't pretend to be a lead guitarist. I yeah. think it's a bit like if you want somebody to do some fine carpentry at your house, you might be able to bang a nail in a wall and put a picture up. But, you know, if you want a cabinet maker, can you get a guy in to do it? Well, <laughs> I get a good lead guitarist in. And I've been fortunate. I've had people like El Slick playing with me you know yeah i was i mean i was going to ask you about that i mean you, you want to talk about a guy who's got a resume that's just pure gold i mean what a, what an amazing career he's had and yeah. he's and it sounds great on this record too like like you would expect him to be yeah but i th i think you know we had a, a symbiotic relationship and then it, it, i've given him a chance to how long have you been doing maybe about 12 years now i did a session with clem and this other guy keenan dufty in the states and clem was in on the session i met him he was learning one of the songs and he said what keys it in and the guy said oh it's in b so he got his capo out right yep. i said you put it on for that and he said yeah i said that's cheating he said you can be like that Matt Locker. i said yes i am gonna be like that so you better start getting used to it and we got on fine you know <laughs> so, so as far as far as clem goes i mean you know he's been playing with uh with blondie for forever and played with a lot of other people too when how did you uh, get to know him I met him donkeys years ago in, in London. I think he came down with the rest of Blondie to see when I did a one-off gig with Sid Vicious, the, the Vicious White Kids, and he was there, and I met him. 
and we kind of kept in touch. He had an idea for doing another band with me and Paul Weller and Woody from the Bay City Rollers. I don't know what was going through his mind, but <laughs> anyway, we kept in touch and we've done loads of different pieces of work over the year. And kind of just over a year ago, he called me up and said, um, it wasn't working out for whatever reason. I don't know. I don't really know. And I'm not going to go into it anyway, but with a bass player they had had, and they was trying to fulfill the tour that they should have done two or three years ago, but couldn't because of lockdown. And they needed a bass player. And they said, will you come and do it? And I said, well, in a couple of months, he said, no, next week. And I was like, ah. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I thanks for doing it. I'm glad, I'm glad I have done it. I really love playing with them. They've yeah. got a great bass of work. Nice guys, you know, Debbie's fantastic. I mean, they've got a real kind of Greenwich Village kind of call about them somehow. They're interesting. You know, and, and do you know what? We did Coachella three weeks ago, and the next thing, now Rogers is getting up with us, you know? Yeah. Do you like going to the, those festivals, or is that a, a, a lot of a lot of headache for you? I don't mind playing at them, basically, because you have, get your own solo. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Because, I mean, you know, uh, over the weekend, the, uh, the Cruel World Festival happened in Pasadena, California. Well, we did that last year. Yeah. With Blonde. Well, a, a portion of the of the of that show was rained out. So Susie, who hadn't played in the U.S. in 15 years, he got rained out. Iggy Pop got partially rained out, and they wound up rescheduling that part with uh, Susie, Iggy, and uh, Gary Newman last night. So they finally they finally finished that. Oh, but what a, cool. yeah, good. But what a yeah, it's it's just it happens with outdoor festivals. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I, 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 I've only been back from LA two weeks, and not long before I came back, a couple of days, I went to see Iggy play the Palladium, and it was fantastic. Yeah. It was really. Andy finished up the set for an encore. He did, um, you know, the Rose Bowl or whatever it, they played, but it, at the Palladium, he finished up with Walk on the Wild Side, and it was great. And he sat on the edge of the stage, and he meant it when he sang it. Yeah. It was really cool, and that was probably the last thing, song I would have expected him to do you know and chad was playing drums who i actually met in mexico he was playing at the same hotel with his blondie in mexico city and i think they've been doing a chili peppers gig somewhere so it was really cool chad because it was sort of it was dusk and there was a big garden in the hotel and i sort of half recognized him when i went flee i thought he was <laughs> flea, but he wasn't he didn't say any so you're playing didn't you and i said yeah but he didn't get up and calling him flea and he was cool yeah this has been kind of a weird year for for you guys and, and the rest of the Sex Pistols. I, and I know you've been very vocal about what you felt about the uh, the Danny Boyle series that came out, and yeah, you know, particularly how they portrayed you and, and your exit there. Then you know, there's lawsuits to contend with. Where do you think that whole thing went wrong? I don't think Paul was over an I, I just think it's one of those things like Hollywood has an idea of what rock and roll is, and it's nowhere near the nowhere near the truth really and it, 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 there's bits in it you know what i went to see um the elvis movie which i kind of enjoyed but how true it is i don't know but there's a bit in it you know where Elvis is making his breakthrough and somebody says who's this guy that they're all going on about and one person says oh he plays black rhythm and bruise and another guy goes coupled with white country and western right and it's like a real device and you can see it coming and in the Danny Boyle thing, he could see all these things coming. You know, I was disappointed that it could have been so good and it wasn't. I thought it was important that it was made because it's based on Steve's book. And Steve was the guy that formed the band, you know. So. I think the thing that some people had a problem with is that it did kind of come off in kind of like a, almost like a cartoon in some ways, where the telling a story, it may be fictionalized in, in parts and, and some of it just seemed to be you know, almost uh, just not believable. And, I, and I'm and i sure it's a very different, it, it had to be very, very different, especially in the beginning than what you saw. Were there parts of it that you thought he had right? No, really, no. <laughs> <laughs> it may be stuff that I can't comment on is, is Steve's upbringing, you know, and his, yeah. his, uh, his um, relationship with his stepfather. And I don't know, you know, and we've never really spoken that much about it and I doubt Steve particularly wants to and I respect that. It's just Steve said to me, he said, what do you think? I said, mate, you got a shocking memory. <laughs> <laughs> and we went for this, that and the other. But I don't want to make a big deal about it. I think it's been and gone. You know, I was sort of supposedly 
like the Beatles too much. It's not true. But I think, you know, if he'd made a movie like Our Day's Night, which is kind of shot in a very cinema verite kind of way, but is wacky and is deliberately surreal, <laughs> it's a bit more honest than something that's a partial kind of truth and you don't really know where to... You know, nobody really thinks that Paul McCartney's granddad would come to the London on the train with them from Liverpool and go around chatting up all the girls and they'd all be saying how clean it is, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous, but it kind of worked. The Danny Boyle thing, I just thought it was a bit lazy, to be honest. Yeah. Leading up to it, obviously, there was a, there was a good deal of, uh, of legal issues between the three of you and, and John Lydon trying to figure out the licensing of the music. And, and I know it got really ugly and, and, and it put you all kind of in a tough spot. Where are you guys now with this? I mean, do you still talk to them or is it just, is it just a two? Oh, I, I, I spoke to Stephen Paul. John, my number, but he, I can't remember the last time he called me up. And I think maybe when he called me up, possibly the last time, which was probably about 25 years ago. Yeah. He wasn't called me up he got his kind of go to to do it you know so one of the things that uh that kind of surprised a lot of people and, and i don't think people realized how much chrissy hind would play a part in that story what's the reality of that i mean how much oh, oh, Craig, Craig chrissy lives near me and i said i went to see this thing i didn't realize you and steve were so close i knew you were mates she she said get off it i only shagged him once <laughs> chrissy said <laughs> Well, yeah. I said, it's all the movie, and she went, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I knew she was around and in England and, 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 you know, was around the store and everything, but I just, I like, was she that much involved? And it just, I, I was kind of surprised to see that. She, she was around. I've actually got in my scrapbook somewhere, you know, when you go into those old fashion, fashion photo booth machines, and it was <laughs> right. like four pictures for a dollar or four pictures for a pound. Yeah. I, we did two strips, and it's me and Chrissy, and I've got one strip, and she's got the other strip, she said, from like 1975 or something. She was around. And yeah. In fact, I remember being in this pub down the King's Road at lunchtime, and we were just sitting there having a quiet drink. She had been writing the NME at the time, and she was very excited that she was going to go and interview David Cassidy, right? <laughs> And he was sitting in the pub, and this guy walks in, and Chrissy started going, bop, 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 bop. So I joined in, and we're singing, bits and pieces, bits. <laughs> Mike Smith from the Dave Clark Five had walked in, and he thought we was taking the mickey out of him. But we weren't. We both liked. <laughs> he left. He got look and left. But I said to Chrissy when he'd gone, I said, how do you know the Dave Clark Five is? She said, you're kidding me. They was bigger than the Beatles at one stage in, in Akron, Ohio. One thing I also wanted to ask you about, you know, and I mentioned, you know, briefly, the uh, Vivian Westwood died in in December. Tell me about her. I mean, I know you worked for her, and you knew, you've known her for a long time. Tell me a little bit more well, about what she was like. Little, I knew her a little bit for a long time, but I had I hadn't seen her face to face until Malcolm McLaren's funeral, which mm. was eight, nine, six, or seven. I don't know how long ago it was now, and I was waiting outside for it all to start, and a cab turned up. And Vivian was there and she got out of the cab and she went, oh, Glenn's here. That's nice. You know, and we kind of, sort of sent a few messages for us sons about something or other. But I hadn't really been in touch with her for a long while, but I like Vivian. She was, you know, very kind of stood her ground, forthright, clever, intelligent woman. Any success she'd had would have been totally in her own terms, which is very hard to do in this day and age. I went to China. I went to Shanghai maybe eight or nine years ago mm -hmm. and um, I got there and I got in like sort of six o'clock in the morning, probably had a bit too much coffee to keep me awake and then finally got to the hotel and then realised I was a bit wired from the caffeine. Thought I'd go for a walk. Oh, it's quite a smart hotel. I had no idea what to expect from Shanghai and I got it. Because I thought, well, if I'm going for a walk, I don't want to get lost. I better find a landmark. I looked around, and the hotel was right next to a Vivian Westwood flagship store. Yeah. And that, <laughs> now, that's something. Now, considering when I worked for her, she used to say, right, you know, you know, I'm not a meat eater, but if you're going to that chicken and chips place, you know, like Kentucky Fried Chicken over the road, will you keep the boxes? I'm, what do you want the boxes for? She, well, it's not the boxes, it's the bones. And what she would do, would take the bones home, 
boil them up and then sew them onto t-shirts and said things like rock and roll or perv or something like that <laughs> so that was my kind of dealings with her back then and the next thing i'm in shanghai and there's a flagship store it's kind of it's quite an achievement really yeah and when i i i'm fortunate and should have been but i was honored to be invited to a memorial service at southwick cathedral earlier on in the year and it was just a who's who of the music and the fashion world and and in fact talking about chrissy hine she sang a song and she was big friends with with, yeah. with um vivian and she sang ran in my heart by buddy holly and she got choked up halfway through hmm. it was quite touching you know it sounds like that that store by all accounts was kind of like a sponge of of people i don't know if it was actually buying stuff out of that store but it certainly seemed to be a place where people were were yeah, hanging out scene it was an epicenter of cool no, yeah was afraid yeah, it was an happy sudden call. Nearly anybody and everybody who passed through its doors at some stage went on to do something of some kind of consequence. You know, and you can't say that about many haberdashers. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's what, that's what um, Jerry Nolan from the New York Dolls, you know, because Malcolm got involved with, with many ways. Like, it didn't quite work out when he managed him, but Jerry <laughs> described him as that old haberdasher. <laughs> Speaking of, of, of Malcolm, the last time we talked, you, you, you mentioned about, you know, we, we talked a little bit about him and at the end of, the, end of the, the, the Danny Boyle series, I mean, they certainly had a, they depicted him in a certain way that made him seem either he was intentionally trying to create just this chaotic mess or he really did know what he was doing. What do you think that was really in his head and, and driving? Uh, both, really. And I think in the Danny Boyle film, I think the guy who plays Malcolm, apart from the fact he sort of looks a bit too young, maybe not as far as Malcolm was, but in relation to the other characters. But I thought he had Malcolm spot on from yeah. my memory. You know, that whole scene in the court. I wasn't in the court that day, but, you know, just the way he spoke and his kind of choice of over over embellished phrases and stuff i thought it was pretty good and the, and the woman who played vivian was good she had her accent down i, I looked her up actually and then i thought <laughs> i didn't realize i found out she's been married to elon musk twice that's interesting i, I, I won't because she had that one but <laughs> she had vivian westwood vivian westwood's accent down just right you're going to be doing some uh, some solo shows you know to promote the uh, the record uh, you know consequences coming uh, with stiff little fingers I think peter hook is involved in a couple of those shows and then it's my understanding that you'll be touring again with blondie yeah and and, and through june um we've got like eight or nine or ten um festivals in the uk we're doing Glastonbury and we're doing this big thing called Dog Day Afternoon with Iggy's on the bill. And Stephen Paul have got a band called, with Billy Idol called um, Generation Sex and they're playing, but they're below us on the bill. So, ha ha ha. <laughs> so, I've got that and some more Blondie stuff, odd things later on in the year, but hopefully I'm going to be back in the States in the fall with a line up of mine. You know, I've been getting good feedback from the with the album and you know the record these days although it kind of stands up by itself if people like it but it's also a calling card you know and i, I did a one-off show in at the roxy in la at, at the tail end of the blondie dates that i've just done and clem yeah. played drums Gilby clark played and even fred armison got up with a stern back and wrote <laughs> it, so that's kind of cool yeah. it's funny how Fred seems to work his way into every possible show in Los Angeles. He's, yeah, he plays with everybody now. Oh, I've never met him before, and he's a cool guy. You yeah. Know, like, the uh, the record is great. And like I said, it, Head on a Stick is like one of those songs that, that uh, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, I got to play that again. I've been playing it a lot in like the last couple of days. Like, It's just such a such a great song and, and in, a, in a career in which you've written a bunch of great songs. I think that one really holds up. You should be real proud of that one. I am, I am. I think there's a few in the album. I'm quite, you know, I like consequences coming and all. It's not as quite as tough as um, as uh, Ed on a stick, but um, you know, he goes through phases. I'm not, not being big Ed. I think I always write an all right song, but occasionally you come out with a a, a better than an all right one. I think that that's one of them. Glenn, it's great to talk to you again. I wish you best of luck with everything you're doing. Good luck on the road with uh, with Blondie and and your tour and with the record great to talk to you yeah all right mate all right there you go 
The name of the new album from Glenn Matlock is called Consequences Coming, and be sure to check out the first single, Head in a Stick. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to like it, share it, tell all your friends about it. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can email me, too, at Bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.